So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, do you like the title? If you do nothing extraordinary, nothing extraordinary happens. Yeah. So um, don't don't tell your kids that though, right? <laughs> you never know what might happen. Um, but we'll start off with the future of work, and then we'll get into that. Um, I just noticed October 28, 2018, two eights. Who's from Asia? What does eight mean? Prosperity. It's the lucky number, right? In China, it's, it's infinity. So hopefully we'll have a lucky night. Um, so uh, the, I was asked to talk about our practice. Uh, I'm very humble about it, but just give you a sense of when, when I present, where are we coming from to give you this knowledge? We're, we're a business advisory practice. We, we help companies that are going through transformation understand the organizational and people and leadership aspects of what needs to change to make the strategy happen. So we just focus on three things. Mergers and acquisitions. This practice in America is one of the top M&A practices, um, if not the top, that deal with people matters. The second thing is we help companies go through business transformation. And most of that is they're going through something digital. They're, they're, they're digitalizing their own work or they're trying to connect with their customers in a digital way. Uh, and the third thing we do is help move people around the world. It, it has been fascinating. In the, in the last five years, just to give some sense of credibility that maybe we're doing the right thing, um, we, we have grown. In the last five years, we added um, over 140 new partners and, and executive directors into the practice. Um, this year alone, we're going to hire over 300 people. And each year we hire between 250 and 300 people. And so we're just mushrooming. And, and most of like my peers in, in all of our competitor firms are coming. So there's close to 30 George equivalents from all our competitors that have come. So something's happening, right? We're doing something where you know, people want to make a difference and put a thumbprint on changing the future of work in a, in a positive way. So before we go in, before I kind of share with you what we came up with as you know, the approach, because every company wants to know what's the approach. Now, how do I attack the people and organizational matters in, when I'm going through transformation? But you have to understand where you're coming from. Obviously, the rapid growth of technology, it's amazing. Um, we have a tool, right? And there's other ones out there that you can, you can put 200,000 people in the database, and we can do a tool. We can tell you every single job role description in every function in every country that can be automated in two weeks without talking to a single person. I mean, we're getting that far advanced in terms of identifying how the work can change. The technology impact on humans, I think any solution for leaders or people in the company has to hit on what's happening to us because of technology. So you heard of techno stress, right? Eight different technologies, eight different communication things happening to you at one time. You're at, you're at your desk, you're texting, you're same timing, you're on the computer and you're on the phone, right? Um, I was at ExxonMobil and we're working with their IT <coughs> function. And they actually felt saddened because they are causing the technical stress because they have eight different communication vehicles in their company. And you know, it's, it's actually overwhelming us. The other technology impact on humans, um, digital dementia, right? I see some heads nodding. OK, how many people can memorize more than 10 phone numbers right now, right? So what's happening is we're not memorizing anymore. And the part of our brain that does the memorization isn't being used, so it's going into atrophy. Right? What other part of our brain is going into atrophy? Empathy and focus. Empathy, think about it. You are supposed to go to your parents, your kid's grandma's house for dinner on Saturday. She's got it all set up, did the shopping. Grandpa went and bought the ice cream. They told the neighbors to stop by. They're so excited you're coming. And you text grandma and say, we can't make it. We got a hockey game. What's missing? You're not on the phone. You're not experiencing 
the emotion, the pain, the sorrow. You don't even have to respond in a way that's humbling and understanding. And when you don't do that, that part of your brain is it's just going into atrophy, right? So there's about 70 studies of college kids growing up, right? Atrophy levels, empathy levels going down. So this is not, I'm not trying to say the gloom and doom here. I'm just saying we have to deal with this, right? As we're trying to help companies get through this. Aging workforce, we have multiple generations, types of workers. I think, you know, y'all know those types of workers, but there's new types. So in our office in Brazil, uh, Brazil requires 5% of your workforce to be disabled. So we have an EY Institute that trains disabled people to come to work, right? But who's training the work people to understand how to work with disabled people? When you have people speaking in sign language in the elevators and folks with autism, right? Um, it's a two-way street. So we have to continue to advance. There is an available supply of labor. You know, there's also legislation in Brazil for 5% of your workforce to be folks coming out of jail, right? Um, I'm on the board of directors of a company called Strive, where in the last 10 years, we put 80,000 people from jails and homeless shelters into jobs. Um, there's 6 million people looking for jobs. There's 6.9 million open jobs. It's just a matter of getting the skill gap closed. And this available labor is the next labor supply that we have to hit. So this is for real. This is happening. And again, it's, it's the supply side and then the demand side getting ready for it. Um, and obviously, on the right-hand side, what it means for companies is we're clearly moving to new operating models. And I'll get into that. Second, clearly new leadership capabilities. Throw everything out the door that got you there. It's all new. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, growing sense of working for a purpose. You definitely need new energy in your work environment. Cultures need to morph. And we all know about new skill sets. So, so in the workplace, if you're a leader, that's what you're. Um, but so just to talk about a couple of CEOs, I thought this was really interesting. Elon Musk. So who saw that? That's two, two, two months old, right? Um, if you read behind what was behind this, right, it was, it was about what we're going to go into. Decision making was impossible, right? And he actually told folks, if you're here and you're trying to work up a chain to get a decision made, skip the process and go. The other thing was communications was a big problem, right? And if you think about it, what's happening is when you put automation in, automation forces horizontal activity across a company. It creates teams. It requires you to work cross functions, right? And, and we're built for vertical. If you listen to everything he's saying, it's the intersection of vertical into horizontal. And we're built for vertical, and we're not. And every single time you hear a problem about automation and it not working, the people side is just what I said. It's going to be about the inability of the company to function horizontally, because it's all built to go this way. Um, the next one was General Electric. Ton of automation going on. Everyone's running around using AI, RPA, and the new CEO says it's a black hole. It's not working. We're not even built to do it and to manage it, right? So they stopped everything, and then they're going to reset and take a look at it. But I think Ginny, you know, got it right at IBM. It's it's really you know about augmentation of technology and humans, and how can technology help us do things better, do our jobs better, help people better. Um, and if you approach your design that way, I think you'll have better outcomes and you won't skip addressing the people side of the technology implementation. So when we talk to our clients, we think it's about technology augmenting. We think HR systems and companies are built for individuals and not teams. And that's a big misnomer. And everything is built for me versus we. Does that make sense? Do I need to go into this? I mean, you get that, right? I mean, it's, it's, this is the core of all levers of an organization, right? And even if you switch six of the 10, the last four that are still me are going to kill you. 
it's your pace systems, your bonus systems, your performance management systems are still me focused and didn't go to the teaming, it's gonna knock you down. The, the biggest lever that is just crushing when we go to technology is the org structure and op models. That's the hardest one to change and what is the new op model, right? So we're all functional, introducing teams, many places are you have a functional job and you have a horizontal team you're in. And then I was just at Zappos where it's a holacracy, it's 100% teams. Gone wild, <laughs> I mean just gone wild. Because you can do a team for everything. If you can make money doing anything, you create a team, you create a circle. And I love the circle concept because what happens is in my job, think of how many circles we're in. I'm on my day team, I'm on another team you know, that's a team. And then you start identifying and it actually forces, I think the, the rebadging of people to work together in a, in a way that you just do teams. Um, I think they just had like too many of them, but they, they have a great concept and I think there's some answer in the middle. But I think the, the app model is, is um, and then the immunity to change. I know Bob Keegan was here and you talked about the immunity to change. But you know, I challenge, I, I really challenge it. So are we the dominant species on the planet? How did we get there? Was it by saying, hey, I'm not changing? Yeah, what happened to make us start acting like that? We saw birds flying and someone built a plane, right? So what's going on about this immunity, right? And then how do we unleash it? Right? Because I don't think many of us are built to just resist. So, and I'm so sorry, maybe this didn't come out as good. So, <laughs> but what we're seeing is we're working with clients in the future of work is everything needs to change. The top of the picture is called the operating model. And those are all the levers that impact the op model. On the bottom is the operating environment or your culture. And those are the new levers that impact the operating environment. And if you gave me any question in the world, I can solve it through the levers on this page. So when I talked about what's happening in the world, we took all those inputs of all those things happening earlier and we said, what are the things we can use and as our answers collectively or individually to answer how to build a better recruiting trap, how to make a millennial happy, how to get teams to work, how to create new leadership styles, right? All the questions are coming up. What, you, what was interesting on this is probably 60% of the people levers don't sit in HR. Think about that. And even if HR is in some form of a maturity model, you know, that's progressive, right? You still aren't covering enough things that really are truly going to help or hinder the organization. So it's really a CEO issue who can address all these. But two years ago, physical environment is on the right hand side. Probably one of the most important levers, and I, who would say that real estate is the most important people lever, right? For multiple things, you can design your real estate to cause intentional collisions of like-minded people. You can put all your thinkers and creators of new ideas on one floor. You can put all your builders on another floor and all your scalers on another floor. So as GM was building the driverless car, all the functions that had to work on it, they put all the functional people that were thinkers on one floor. And then they asked, well, how can we design this space? They asked to cut holes in the floor so that they can see when the other teams are meeting and they can take these spiral stairs and run down. And then so the builders can go listen to the thinkers and then the scalers can listen to the builders and they beat all time records to get the car out the door. So real estate, kind of crazy, like in our office in Brazil, the design is such there's no garbage cans, right? We have about seven different spaces to accommodate your style. So if I'm a strategy person, I want the flexibility to be out in the bullpen or separate, but our, our people that are action oriented get offices, right? 
And so, and folks that are in the bullpen might be the explorers or the curators. And if you know your population, you would have enough physical space to accommodate their working styles and create spaces. The second thing which was really interesting, you have to drink your coffee in the coffee area. There's no drinks at your desk. And guess what else is by the coffee area? The restrooms. And guess what else is by the coffee area and restrooms? The exits to the conference rooms. And guess what else is there? The elevators. And guess what happens? In one day in Brazil, I meet everyone. And in six months in New York, I see no one. It's crazy, but real estate is an incredible opportunity. Then you can just go to the health of real estate and biophilia and building designs. And you know, there's, um, you can get gold, silver standard. There's the lighting, the ergonomics, the food. Does your real estate force you to get up and move? Does it force you to exercise? There's all these things that bring about mind clarity at work due to your real estate. They actually found there's a retina, uh, there's a, a, a light sensory behind our retina that we just found out about that actually picks up the sunset, the, the lighting, the golden sunset, and actually starts producing melatonin in our bodies to help us go to sleep. And guess what we have in our lightings in our buildings? That same light, putting people to sleep, right? Kind of interesting stuff. I can go on forever just on this one lever. This isn't HR, is it? This is, but it's probably the most prevalent lever in my mind. When I go to Toronto in our office, I am so excited to be there. It's floor to ceiling glass. It's just built so incredibly cool. And people are energized to come to work just because of real estate. The inverse, one of my partner's sons, How's, how's Bobby doing? Loves his job, great, but hates the office and quit. Or hates the commute. What do you think is the number one retention mechanism? You know, I could probably go all day just on this slide. I need to move. But number one retention mechanism is zip code. How far someone has to travel to work and what they experience in that travel. So if you want to retain people, and you want to say who's your longest employed people, and you run the analytics, it's going to be the people from one neighborhood close by. And they probably have a better commute than from other neighborhoods. And then what they experience from the time they get off the train or somewhere to your building, and everything they pass, from shopping to food to laundry to daycare, will make or break your ability to retain people. It's zip code. Yeah, pretty well. Um, so the other one is mindset. We definitely, um, programs that provide a sense of mind clarity are really important. Um, tech experience, you all hear about this employee experience. It's really important. Technology is probably the biggest thing right now that companies are working on to, to create an attractive environment and also retain people. Technology experience from the moment you boot up to all the different ways you communicate is super, super important. Now, again, not in HR. Right? It's probably not even in, you know, the, uh, when you take those annual surveys on how happy you are working there, right? But it's really big. Um, I'll go to leadership and teaming. You know, clearly new leadership mindsets. I think you're going through that. We have some I, I'll point out later. But teaming and teaming ability, I think, is a, a one that's not addressed enough, right? Because technology takes the robot out of the humans. So the job left for us is to start working with each other. And guess what happens, right? We got this whole individual me system going. <laughs> now all of a sudden I'm supposed to start working on these teams. And on the teaming, I think it's one is, is understand, you know, there was a study of two emergency rooms and one had better outcomes than the other due to the diversity of the team. And they identified what were the elements of a team. Strategy, communicator, explorer, conductor, action mover, action developer. There's all these roles. When we form teams, we typically will just put people in like us, right? And then when I see my team's not working, it's because I have three communicators that pick three other communicators and are all trying to, to get something done and two years later I don't see anything, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, but so it's the makeup of the team 
and then who, what, what am I in that team? And you can change roles. And then it's just acceleration of teaming, right? All the different techniques to use for personality styles. I know in Microsoft they use the color mechanism, blue, green, yellow, a little dot on your name tag that says, you know, I'm sunshine yellow, you know, so you know how to approach me versus I'm green mean, you know. And, you know, the whole idea is you change and adjust and tailor how you interact is based on knowing their color, right, through insights. Um, so I think teaming is really big. And purpose and values, again, not in HR, number one thing, right? If you're going through any change, why are we doing it? And do I align with that purpose? Is it purposeful to me? Do I want to be here for a reason? Like I said, when we brought over 140 new direct admit partners, it's, and people left seven digit money behind, people took pay cuts to come because they want to put their fingerprint on building a new way, a new working world, building a better working world. And I think purpose is, is really big. The top one is the, is the one that's the most trouble though, because I think folks are doing things on the bottom, but organization models and not models, as I said earlier, is probably 80% of the hindrance of why companies are having difficulty transforming. And that's, that's why I put those two CEO quotes up top, right? They, they weren't, mod uh, weren't moving their op models to another maturity model to align with the new way that work was getting done in the company. So with all those little circles, we're finding out that clients really are focusing on these four things. Number one is capability. Do I have the right capabilities in my company? Do I have the right leaders, leadership styles? Do I have the right skill sets? And the first answer is no. Second answer is no, right? I mean, there's always gaps. And then do I have the right op model? Um, you know, and it, it, it's a gap analysis. What I have today, where do I need to go? What's my gap? How am I gonna solve it? Am I gonna go to contractors? Am I gonna go to offshoring? Am I gonna do training programs? Can people be trained? How are they best trained? That's bucket one. Bucket two is work is changing and how work gets done is changing. So it's simply, are, are, what are the systems in place to enable the new way of work? So I have the right team and I need to enable that team to work the right way. And that's big on training, big on change management, big on visualization of understanding and seeing the new way of work, seeing the new behaviors, seeing how the technology works and what you're supposed to do and not do. The third thing is, are people motivated? So what are you doing with those levers to make sure? And I'll never forget this. I started working in 1986, and I visited Miller Fillmore Hospital, and the head of HR brought me in. And by training, I'm a lawyer, <laughs> and I'm a CPA. Um, and what I'm saying right now, you know, it's just like how I got here. I have no idea. But um, <laughs> he asked me, and I'm, I'm an ERISA attorney back then, right? I'm all pensions and stuff. And he asked me, how do I make people skip to work? And I was like, I can answer it. It took me 32 years, but I think I can answer it, right? Now, um, but motivating is really important. And then last is people are really focused on, and more so now than ever as we're entering into these headwinds of a recessionary threat, right? It's becoming a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy is everyone's got to just make sure you do your work in the most efficient way, right? So. One, do I have the capability? Am I enabling it? Am I motivating it? And am I efficient in deploying it? All right, those are the four questions we're seeing that you need to solve in the future of work. What makes me happy is when I do go through the airports and see these magazines, and they align with the levers we're talking about, right? So the Harvard was talking about the new operating models. Um, people in strategy had, that was an excellent on teaming and teaming ability. Um, and then the re rebirth of rewards, um, which is going to the we thing. So uh, it's just kind of a self-affirmation. So what's interesting here is I do think when you look at that whole circle, the system is set up against the new way we need to work and everything needs to change. And you have to get it all right. But also it's, it's, it's causing us to have a depletion of energy, right? And that, that's a serious kind of, challenge that you know, we, we need to address. Um, what's really interesting on this, it, it, it reminds me of my daughter. So my, if you look at the top one, picture that as New York City, right? And my daughter is in PR, and she does PR for big pharmaceutical companies and new drugs. 
Um, and she's really good at it. And she has six of the top 10 pharma companies and every, like she knows everything about blood cancer and what you can say and can't say, and any kind of thing out there about her clients. When she's in New York on Sunday night, migraine headache, nervous, unhappy, chewing her nails, constant colds. Bottom picture, she takes a rotation through Dublin, Ireland. I call her on a Sunday night in Dublin. She doesn't even know she has to work the next day. No migraines, no headaches, not chewing her nails. And she's not even like, work isn't even on her mind, right? Look at the difference in the environments we create. It was, it's just really amazing. She sent me a video. Um, I guess they do a lot of uh, karaoke. And like, so on, on Thursday, she sent me a video of her Dublin teammates in a karaoke bar. And I looked at this and it was just all out mayhem, right? And I just looked at my wife and I said, she's not coming home. <laughs> and guess what? She's applying for a visa. Yeah, she's going. Yeah, and I think that's the difference in the systems that we set up and how we operate in the cultural environments. Um, really interesting. So um, I want to switch gears a little bit, but before I do that, are there any questions? I kind of went fast, but there's any, anything? Just do a little pit stop. Am I resonating? Is this okay? Yes. Yeah, so three years ago, you know, and it's really cool. I, I have to run this business, but then it gives me a license to be here and talk about all this stuff and create our programs around this, you know, so. Uh, three years ago, I brought up Mind Clarity. And, and part of it was the depletion thing, right? And just the impact. And, and we're literally evolving as, as we, today, we are about just parts of our brain that are going into atrophy. There's things we can't tap into. We don't have empathy, right? You know, I think this digital dementia is real. And, you know, we're depleted, right? So I said, what could we, given that, what could we put in our formula, right, to be so bold to say, you know, this has to happen in corporate America, right? That you need to address this, which was really cool, is two years later, I think it was Bain. Is anyone here from Bain? In their leadership study, you know, CEO buying clarity is the number one thing in the middle of their leadership principles. They put it in the middle, large. And I was like, thank God, affirmation. Right, because our firm let us run with Mind Clarity. Right, actually, I just signed up to become, you know, a Mind Clarity instructor. I'm going to take two years of a course with Buddhist monks and things like that. Because just fascinated, um, you have to be healthy and you have to have a Mind Clarity. You can't, you know, make good decisions. I actually got to a point in this process pre Mind Clarity, where, and this is true, I have my colleague Joe Deegan, who's my deputy. Right, and Joe and I go way back. And I get into these states, like if you think about, like part of the depletion is this switching, we have to keep switching, switching. I, I have to touch at least 10,000 things a month, at least, at least running this business, thousands of people, hiring hundreds of people, right? And Joe looked at me and he said, George, whatever you're thinking, do the opposite. <laughs> And you know what? He was right. I got to a point where I was just all backwards. And he, it was part of a Seinfeld episode, I guess, right? It's Costanza, right? Working for the Yankees. And when I hit that point, I was like, what in the world is going on? Because I was processing in a way that was just not healthy, right? And, and at times, I actually do that as a check. Should I do the opposite? You know, you have the 24-hour rule and all that. I do the opposite rule. So for mind clarity, it's just that. It's just, it's getting the, the um, uh, cortisol levels down, serotonin levels up, right? And it's, it's bringing about a sense of clarity so you can think. What I started to do, and Priya is gonna talk about it, is when we created this and, and everything we do, I, we go out into the woods. Um, I have a compound 
and it's on Lake Erie, and we just take a team of the most intellectuals we have um, that touch whatever we're about to address, and we spend two and a half days. We serve each other food. We do bonfires. We kayak. We watch sunsets. We look at stars, mm -hmm. and we come up with the craziest stuff in the world because it's, it's biophilia, which is man's innate need or desire to be in nature, and when you're in nature, it's a cheating way to achieve mind clarity. <laughs> and not just that, I always take my dog, and that is another cheating way, because when you play with Simon, like, everything gets good, <laughs> right? I take my dog. Um, the other cheating thing I do is, uh, well, not cheating, but um, I bought all these exercise balls and mats, and then we're out in the lake in the morning barefoot, grounding, doing exercises with an instructor. And it, it, we build all this in, and, and I'm not sure, I don't tell people why we're doing it, but we just do it. And, but we come up with the best solutions ever through that. So that's, that's how we've been addressing it. Um, but what, what I'd like to do is, this is really something, and I'm switching gears from the future of work to, um, now you, I, I came into this saying, right? I was like, and we're all sitting around, I'm like, how the heck do we get to this practice to the next level? And I just, we, we have what Bob talks about is the immunity to change, right? Um, but Bob saved me, because he says, if you can breathe, you can change, <laughs> okay? And I'm sitting there going, hallelujah, right? Because in my mind, if you look at a lot of the folks we have, I'm a lawyer, right? We have calculating type people. And guess what? They're, you know, the longer you do something, the more you're resistant to change. The more specialized you are, the more resistant to change, right? And then certain professions like lawyers, like accountants, like tax preparers, and my change management people have a major resistance to change, okay? <laughs> and so I thought I had this death knell. So I came up with this thing, and I did this this June. I said, if you don't do anything extraordinary, nothing extraordinary will happen. And it was intended to get to that 65% of the people in the middle that don't want to go do it. 20% will, 50% never will, but 65% you have a shot at, right? This was aimed at the 65%. And, and I, I took three things. I took Bob's immunity to change, and then I took storytelling. And then I took resonate. And you know what resonate? Resonate is the, the way you tell stories in a way that will incite action on people when they hear it. So when they hear something, they want to move. And resonate is about you're not the hero. You're here to share your story to help teach and guide a mentor. You personalize elements of your storytelling in a way that people can humanize and relate to it, right? So storytelling is the foundation in the middle. And we just, the storytelling has been around, the method we use has been around since the 1800s, right? There's a set format. We followed the storytelling format. We took the immunity to change and we took resonate. And I put a deck together and I found seven people to tell their stories. And I know these people did something extraordinary. And I thought, if I put these people in front of my 350 leaders, it's going to like, they're going to feel so like ashamed or, or ashamed about their, their immunity to change is so insignificant compared to what these people did, right? And I picked seven people and I wanted to make sure you wouldn't even know who they are. They're not the leaders. They're not popular. They're just unknowns. And I know they did something extraordinary. So I interviewed them. And I said, would you be willing to go on stage and share why you did something extraordinary? And they're, they're him and the OK, or I'm glad you picked me. Um, and we went through it. And I, I just had one question, why? Why did you decide to do the extraordinary? And I'll share with you their whys and their lessons learned, right? Um, so that's what we're going to go through now. Um, it's really interesting. Every single extraordinary story had massive amounts of adversity. 
There was no story without the courage to persevere, no story without resilience, no story without setting a marker, a goal. And guess what? Every single person was an introvert. Every person was an introvert. And every person had a choice. They faced adversity. They could have went to the right, which is face adversity, do the right thing. And they each came out the other side, a better version of themselves they never knew. And then we had people that didn't make the stage that go to the left and play victim when they face adversity. It's all the things that are impacting me. It's the firm, it's this, it's that. They have every excuse, every blame, every point. And it's really wild. Every single time now when I have to talk with people, like we're making leadership changes and in the partnership, it's rented roles. Like, so I'm not gonna be the leader forever. Someone else will come in and come to me and say, you're not the leader. Am I gonna go to the right or left? The last person you know, I told, they said, I'm gonna quit. Well, obviously they went to the left, right? And, and that's a true tell, of, I think, of, of the kind of leadership character you need in this new environment. So I'll just highlight some of these. Um, it's, it's pretty clear, success isn't without a struggle, is Nikki. Nikki is, is an unknown partner that joined our firm as part of an acquisition. Nikki is leading our largest client. She's managing $45 million on the most of revenue on the most complex merger in the history of the world. Nikki's daughter during this period got hit by a car and they're ready to amputate her leg in Hawaii. You want to talk about adversity. She gets on stage and goes through the chance for blood clots, the chance for infection. Do we save her leg, right? You're on the biggest account. The client loves you, right? And her thing is success isn't without a struggle. It's about the people around you that we could do more together than alone, meaning people rallied to help her, right? And without that sense of collective cooperation, this never, you know, she never would have came out of the year as, as the all-star the way she did. Now, a lot of this adversity is really wild. It's not just business adversity, it's personal adversity, it's physical adversity, right, that, that we ran into. Um, the next one, best ideas require perseverance and hard work. This is a young kid named Kushan, young kid. He goes to Honeywell and comes up with this first ever done technology solution. No one's ever done it. And he says, the client's like, I like this. And he says, I can do that. And he did, and it's never been done. So I call him up. I remember I was in my kitchen. I said, why? What, what, why did you decide to take this on? And you're, you're at risk, because if it doesn't work, right? We don't get paid, all this other stuff. He goes, well, the client wanted it, and I want this to be my career, so if I can't do it, then I wouldn't have a job here. It was just that simple. He says, if this is gonna be my job to do these solutions, then I gotta take them on to have the career I want. And I exist to serve a client. So I persevered, right? Best ideas require perseverance and hard work. And he persevered through it. And it didn't work. But there was just some little API that didn't connect. And then when they found that, it worked. <laughs> but he was in the lowest of lows until they found the API connection. But that was his um, perseverance and hard work. Look for the flowers instead of the weeds. This is Kara Loris. She's working for a client in the Midwest. Two years of developing relationships. The client is about to do a big technology play. We were sole source. And then at the last minute, the client said it's going out to bid. It started treating us just like, you know, like we don't even know you. So what do you think Kara and the team said? We want to fire the client. You ever have those situations? You want to fire a guy like, okay, what did my dog meet, right? And 
she rebounded, they proposed, it became highly, and the other, our competitors were thrown in massive amounts for free, and it was international, and it required all the parts of our firm to come together. And she said, I just looked for the flowers instead of the weeds. And she personalized the story through resonating by, like in the morning, her young kids were making breakfast, and it was all over the floor, and cereal was all over the floor. But she said, at least they were trying to help. You know, and that was the flowers instead of the weeds. Um, it's your turn. This is April Holmes. April Holmes was going home from work at the EY, was stepping onto a subway, and the train took off. And she went under the train. And the train stopped on her leg. The last words she heard were, could someone get her leg? She wakes up in the hospital and she looks and there's no leg. She's not getting transparency. A couple of weeks, the doctors are trying to reach her and they put some magazines in her room. You know what the magazines were? Paralympics. And she's looking through the magazines and she's like looking at all the people that are winning gold medals and she just said, it's my turn. And she got a gold medal for the United States in the last Olympics. It's her turn. She said, it's our turn. It's just a mindset shift that will drive you to make it your turn. Um, set markers for success. This is a pretty cool one for people that run businesses. Um, we have a client. And we're in the region. So there's thousands of clients. And the region was short on the revenue plan by $40 million. And one client team said, we will take that 40 million bogey. They had a revenue plan of 89 million. They had no idea how they're going to make the 40 million. They said, up our revenue plan to 129. And we'll take the entire 40 million. And we have no idea, but in 12 months, we'll deliver on 129. Guess what they delivered on? 189. Set markers for success. They said if they would not have put the extra 40 million on, they never would have got the 189. They probably wouldn't have got the 89. But it rallied them. Set markers for success, right? And so we'll go to the last one. Focus on what you control. So, so this one is a, um, this one's, it's a hard one. Um, This one is, uh, this was my son. Um, my son was r riding a motorcycle um, in November and uh, he, he uh, got in an accident and um, he, was a, he went through a fence and he was on the side of a road in a field in Nashville and uh, he looked at his leg and his bone was sticking out this way and he tried to stand up and everything just moved. Um, he had no help. Um, he tried to call the police and his phone wouldn't work. And um, he actually uh, finally got through and he, he called his mom. And you know, my son is uh, an avid hockey player. He played for Syracuse University. He played for the United States. He played internationally backcountry skier, mountain biker. And she goes, why are you calling me? And he says, because I think this is the last phone call I'm going to make. And I was there. And you know, then he hung up on the call and then started flashing his phone. And the car came by, um, pulled away, came back, pulled away, came back, and, and came to help him, got the ambulance. Um, the first day was $750,000 of surgery to just keep him alive because of internal bleeding. He fractured his entire hip. Um, it was all in pieces. Um, his pelvis was in pieces, two broken hips, broken back, and the femur sticking out sideways and all this internal bleeding. Um, day two was to put all the titanium rods in. And then day three was a surgery to um, do a Picasso to the hip to take all the bones, realign them, make sure 
the two legs can move in the joints and then put plates and screws and they went in through the back and they couldn't get to it so they had to roll him on this front and, and they had to do a c-section there and they had to take all his organs out and then they had to put all these screws in um, so if you think of a young kid 26 that had the world that was a highly competitive athlete that now was going to face a life of no, he didn't have the use of his body from the waist down. So I want to show you a small part of his speech on what you need to do um, to face adversity. I'm active. I enjoy being outside more than anything else in the world. You get me out in the woods, that's where I belong. Um, so <laughs> After I recently moved to Nashville from Denver, Colorado, I was riding my motorcycle for the entire day. It was a great day, and after a long day of riding, you get a little tired. So I was starting to head home, and right before you get to my neighborhood, there's a right turn you can make that is a beautiful back road. And a good song came on, and I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take that right turn. And I looked in front of me, I had about, probably about like a second to make these quick decisions and I saw a fence. I see a telephone pole there and I see iron rods. Do I try and lay the bike down? Do I go into the fence? So I decided I'm gonna you know, take this the hard way. I put my head down, tucked into the bike, went right through the fence. Clean break right through the femur. That's the reaction I always get. Just see when I tell my family. It's a, okay, I'm clearly bleeding internally. I'm clearly heavily injured. I need to one, keep my heart rate down. Two, I need to contact emergency services. Three, I need to figure out what's exactly wrong with me. So the first thing I do is I call my mom. <laughs> first thing she says is, why are you calling me? Why aren't you calling 911? Starts so getting angry at me and I go, well mom, I'm calling you because I think this is the last call I'm gonna be able to make. And she goes, why are you so calm? I'm like, well, if this is the last call I make, I'm glad it's with you. And I've looked back at my life, it flashed really quickly and I go, I'm happy. I, you know, I'm, I don't have any regrets. So I keep on trying to call the police and I realize it's not getting through. I'm laying in a ditch, it's not dark out and I'm wearing a black leather jacket. So I pull out the flashlight on my phone I start hitting the SOS Morse code. And then, so finally the ambulance comes. They take me to Vanderbilt. During the whole time I'm cracking jokes with them. The, the ambulance driver is like, I don't understand how you're so happy. I said, I'm living the dream. I'm still here. I'm still talking. I'm alive. Two days later, after having a completely shattered pelvis, they put three massive rods that go the whole length of my pelvis in the back, a plate in the front of my pelvis with eight screws coming out the front. Ten days later, I leave Vanderbilt. I end up going to assisted living center where I'm being told by all these doctors, they said, you know, you're never going to be able to ski the way you ski, the way you used to ski. You're never going to be able to mountain bike the way you used to mountain bike. You're never going to be able to play hockey again. You might not run again. You might always have a limp. As my recovery starts getting more towards the end, we hit about month three, my doctors are saying, okay, it'll be about three weeks until you can go home. And they're like, you haven't even stood up yet. You don't know how it's going to be. I'm like, yeah, well, that's fine. I've always ever done things. I'm going to turn this up to 11, and I'm going to do one week. Six days after I stood up, I was going home. I was doing stairs. I beat all the doctors. I beat everything they even said by more than half, I want to say. And it was just controlling what I could control. That's all I could do at a time point. And that's anytime, you, anytime anything gets crazy. It doesn't matter what you're doing, work, professional, at home, health. You have to control what you can control because anything else other than that is completely pointless. You're just wasting your own energy. So controlling what I can control, I'm, supposed to, uh, I'm still supposed to be on a cane until August. I'm supposed to have a limp until August. Yesterday, I rode eight miles on a bike with a thousand foot elevation gain twice, and then I also hiked three miles with my dog. So, all you have to do is really just control what you can, focus on one thing a day that you can better yourself on, and you can break all the odds. It's actually kind of easy. Trust me. All right. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Um, it, that, We could just go to the next slide, and then uh, so okay. So whatever people say about millennials, forget that, right? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Um, this was 
he, he could not use his body waist down for three months. They had to lay, just lay. And um, I remember the first day he took a step. He had to relearn to walk. Um, he was out in six days, six days from his first step. I was in the car at 12.01 midnight, Thursday night, because his release was Friday. So you want to talk about doing the extraordinary. Now, doing things before your body's ready to be healed isn't extraordinary. <laughs> but I just think having this mental attitude, this inspiration, him standing there, when he was leaning on the chair, obviously because his, his whole right leg was in pain, right? Um, this was very soon, you know, after he got out. Um, and uh, so I guess for the folks that do the extraordinary to wrap up, you, you have to have a positive mindset. Um, I'm, I'm into this new word called collective cooperation. And, and we have a collective intelligence. Well, there was, it was collective intelligence. Thank you. Um, we're on to something here. I think we became this dominant species by collective cooperation, right? We use language to cooperate. And then with that, we build a sense of intimacy, which leads to trust. And then through that, we can do great things. And I do think if we can be a dominant species, why can't we use those same principles through all those levers and create a dominant company under those same principles? Um, persevere uh, is really big. Um, setting markers for success. You know, as my son said, focus on what you can control. And I, I do think the resilience is key, right, as part of all this. Um, so you, when you look at what he went through, you know, it was about blood clots, right? It was about infections. It was about bones healing and so much of just negativity. I'll never forget every Friday, he was in a nursing home, right? And they have to send reports to the insurance company to allow him to stay. And the nurse that did the reports would tell him, you're lucky you got me because I'm getting you to stay here. Because without me, those reports, they would tell you to go home. And there she was freaking them out. So when she came the last time, she says, I'm going to get you for six more weeks. He said, I'm going to be out of here before you do your next report. And he stood up and left before her next report went in. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Oh, who's my son dating? Um, oh, so if you're 26 years old and you're in the nursing home, um, do you think that like people want to come see who you are? So he had a lot of the staff coming through, right? Um, nurses, people delivering food, you know, male people. Um, so my son was just like, Dad, just keep sending postcards, keep sending mail. And then I got all of EY and uh, everyone I knew was sending him stuff. They even got model cars, everything. Mail, mail, mail. He had a crush on the mail delivery girl. <laughs> so it worked. They're still going out now. Yeah. So now they're dating and yeah. They're a thing. So <laughs> he's, he's a clever kid. Um, so I, I do think we are in the time in society, you know, even with the perseverance, um, you know, we, we have an opportunity to do great things if we do it smartly. And great moments come from great opportunity. And I think we are in a time now for great opportunity. And with that, I thank you. Yeah. Thank you, George, for sharing your work on the future of work. If everyone uh, that's leading visions for the future of organizations has such a sweet, pure heart, we're in very good shape. <laughs>